So this is a, this is a complicated study as we continue our uh, series through Paul's letter to the Galatians. And Dave White, I'm glad you're well also tonight. Erica, up there, glad you guys are strong and recovered. Amen. And uh, glad to have you here this evening. Dave, can we go to the big map that we use every week, first thing this evening? As I take just a moment, we've been gone for two Wednesday nights uh, from our study in Galatians, and so I want to take a moment to remind you, did anybody, oh, did anybody two Wednesday nights ago come without having heard that church was canceled? Anybody? Anybody? Did anybody come? I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. I... (laughs) Mel and Shirley drove from Rolla, Missouri. No, they didn't drive from Rolla, Missouri. Uh, If you did, sign up for our church notification system. If you have a smartphone, it'll send you a text message, and it'll it'll send you as many things as you wanted to send you, believe me. It'll send you lots of, no- lots of notices when we have a cancellation or something like that. If you want to sign up for that, very easy. See Pastor Bob right after service tonight. We'll get you signed right up. And then, uh, Val, I thought, my, last Wednesday night after church was over, I thought, I wonder if anybody told Val and her family. She's just moved back to Jeff City. I bet she's not on the notification list. And then I thought about the Hamlins over here, and I thought, I wonder if they're on the notification. And I thought about a variety of people. Have they signed up yet? So sign up if you can. Once in a great while, we might have to cancel for some reason. Pastor Bob? $20 it's a $20 <laughs> Pastor Bob says it's a $20 sign-up fee, but we just know he's trying to milk the congregation yet again. All right. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Let's look at our map of uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. This is actually a map that comes to us from the book of Acts, chapters 13 and 14, Uh, a, a missionary journey, Paul's first missionary journey that took place in the years 47, 48 A.D., When Paul traveled from his home base, this had become his home base, Antioch, and he traveled up into, through the island here of Cyprus, but ultimately up in this region of Galatia. This is southern Galatia here, and planted a number of churches as recorded in the book of Acts. Paul then would finish that missionary journey, come back to Antioch. Some trouble would arise that we don't have time, time to go into tonight, but In conjunction with that trouble at Antioch, these churches in Galatia, new churches, young churches, churches maybe six months, a year old, something like that, had already been infiltrated by some false teachers who were telling them that it was not enough to believe in what Jesus did on the cross when he died and rose again for our salvation that you also had to become, basically become Jewish and follow the Jewish law and the men all needed to be circumcised according to Jewish law and you had to keep all the Jewish law otherwise you were not really saved. Well, you can imagine this brought Paul to a place of great, of great uh, struggle in his ministry because Paul had just preached to them the way to be saved is to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that He died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. And if you'll believe that and receive Him as the answer for your sins and as your personal Savior, you will be saved. And and you'll receive the gift of eternal life, the simple gospel. Well, these Jewish false teachers were, were corrupting all of that. And how many of you know that if you have to resort to trusting something else in addition to Christ, then you're not really trusting that Christ is enough? Do you understand that picture then? So their salvation here, these, these new, their salvation is at stake as they begin to trust in something other than the finished work of Jesus Christ. So Paul writes his letter, the first letter we have from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Paul writes his letter to the Galatian churches here uh, to, to confront that false doctrine. And the whole book of Galatians uh, is, is interwoven around that theme. 
And that's what we've been studying these past several weeks. Tonight we come to lesson number nine, and it's Galatians chapter four, verse 21, as Paul continues to confront that false doctrine. And he uses in tonight's scripture a rather complicated uh, illustration from the Old Testament that is mixed with a variety of other metaphors from, from the Old Testament that makes the whole thing fairly complicated. Now... Peter wrote, as he closed his second letter, 2 Peter, he wrote, Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand. We just have to say, Peter knew what he was talking about. Because Paul has some complicated things in his letter. So tonight we're going to study Paul's illustration about Hagar and Sarah, two ladies in the Old Testament, the two mothers of Abraham's sons, okay? Abraham's sons, Ishmael and Isaac. So I've titled the message this evening, Hagar and Sarah, etc., because there's a lot of etc. in here. And before we even go to our Galatians passage, we need to move to the Old Testament to read. Uh, Turn back with me to the back side of that main outline to read the account of Hagar and Ishmael in the Old Testament. So, How many of you, when you read scripture with us while we're preaching, you pay attention to the content of it? Yeah. So let's not just pass it on by. Let's pay attention to the story here that we're going to read because it will serve as the foundation for Paul's message in Galatians. Here we are in Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, even though by this time God had promised him children. Okay? But they hadn't come, nobody had, a child had not come yet. Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after, just like a man, huh? Go ahead and take this other young woman that we know. And yeah, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai took his, took his wife, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress, Sarai. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Just like a woman. To put the blame on everybody. I put my servant in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Now look up at me in the middle of this story, everybody. Let me make a very plain statement. Not everything done or said by people in the Bible was right. Okay? So when we look at this story of Abraham here and what he did in the midst of this story, we just can't say, well, all of this was in... In God, God, all this is what God wanted. No, no. Abram was a sinful man just like the rest of humanity. He made good choices. He made bad choices. He's remembered in the New Testament primarily for the good choice he made to believe God's promise and to be God's friend. But along the road of his life, he made some doozy mistakes. And so we, we don't condone all of this, you know, Abram says, go ahead, and, go ahead and do whatever you want with her. He should have, it's not right. It's just not right here, okay? Now we come to verse 7. The angel of the Lord, so uh, verse 6, then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar... Servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. 
Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. This is one of my, this is, I have as the third page in your packet tonight, this outline, where is it? This outline that I preached a number of years ago, you are the God, maybe, maybe my favorite sermon I have ever preached comes from this obscure Old Testament story. Because how many of you know God sees us when everybody else has kicked us out? Are you here tonight? And and, and Hagar gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lehi, Lehi Roy. Uh, It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son he had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Now we come to Genesis 21 uh, as, as the son has grown, okay? And as another baby is born, the promised child... Isaac is born, but how many of you know when Isaac is born, Ishmael is a young kid. He's 12 years old. He's still there in the mix. And Isaac is born, Genesis 21, verse 1. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah had had borne him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac weaned Abraham, was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said, I said this to somebody today, and, and they, are, they are here, and, and it was a private conversation, but they'll know what, what they'll recognize my saying this. But you know what? Sometimes somebody else can cause a mess. But if you're not careful, they'll drag you down into the mud and you'll be just as muddy as they are. Are you here? And just because they started with something wrong doesn't mean that you can't get pretty wrong in the midst of the situation too with your responses and your reactions and all of that kind of stuff. Okay? So we got stuff back and forth here. We've got Sarai mistreating Hagar. We've got now Ishmael, a, a, a kid, mocking. Why is he mocking? Because he was born first, and they're all celebrating Isaac like he's the firstborn child, and Ishmael knows he's, he's really the firstborn. So th- all, of these, all of these bad vibes moving back and forth. There it is, verse 9. Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abram was mocking And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son. Now, this is the, right there, that's the statement Paul's going to pick up and use in Galatians. Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to what Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also because he is your offspring. Now, I want you to notice here tonight, everybody. Are you listening? 
I want you to notice in this story here that God has all the bases covered here, okay? All right, do you see that? God has all the bases. God, God does not hate Hagar or Ishmael. God has the bases covered. He says, I'll make the son of the maidservant into a nation also because she's your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby... She began to sob. God heard the boy crying. Notice, they're both crying. Out in the, they've been kicked out. They're both out in the desert alone. And they are crying. She began to sob. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies here. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Now, what a story, my goodness. A lot of drama in the story. A story with with just some, I mean, just a lot of troubling thoughts to us. But God is working in the midst of all of it. And God is watching over those who are rejected and abandoned. And God is the one who provides water for the thirsty to anyone who will call out to Him. He's the God who loves us. I said, he's the God who loves us. No matter where we've come from, no matter what our history, no matter what we've been through, no matter what other people think of us or we have done to us, God is the God who loves us and wants to care for us. That does not mean that our life and our future is going to take the track that we think it's going to take. Are you here? But God knows how to visit us and lead us on every track of life that lays before us. Give the Lord a hand for his goodness tonight. He is a good and a merciful God. Hallelujah. That's the account of Hagar and Ishmael. Now we move to the front of the outline. I said we'd have no trouble getting through this. But let's, let's move quickly here. And read from Galatians chapter 4 verse 21. There's so much in that Old Testament story to say. That it's hard even to get through it. And so, but let's read what Galatians chapter 4 verse 21 has to say. Where am I on all of this? Think of where I am. Think of where I am. Think of where I am. Oh. Time's that clock up there say. Here's Galatians chapter 4 verse 21. As the Apostle Paul picks up on that Old Testament story and uses it for an illustration in this debate over whether we're saved by the law of Moses or by Christ Jesus. And here's what Paul writes. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the, rep, for the women, the two women, represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai, that's where the law of Moses was given, and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem. And we think, what in the world? Okay. Uh, Do you have your colored map here? Do you have this map here? It's not on the screen. So pick it up for just a minute. Take a look at this this map. This map that I've got here. A lot of stuff on, on here. But look at the map itself. 
okay? The map itself, all right? Here is, here is Mount Sinai. Wait, look way down at the bottom of the map and see Mount Sinai. And when you see it, say amen. There's Mount Sinai where, uh, you know, the tr- traditional site of Mount Sinai where the law was given to Moses, okay? Look in the very center of the map. Uh, in, well, not quite the center, but look right here on the map and find the city of Jerusalem with a blue dot. Everybody see, this, see Jerusalem? Say amen. amen. All right. Now let's think about uh, where the story of Hagar happened. Okay, the story of Hagar happened here. Here's where Abraham, Abraham was staying in Hebron. Look, just south of Jerusalem, and everybody say, see Hebron, say amen. Okay, there's Hebron. When Hagar fled both times, she fled westward toward number nine there. See where God appears to Hagar? At, if I see that, say amen. Number nine. Everybody find it? All right. There's where, there, there's where, about where that happened. On both, both times, she fled in that direction. Why was she fleeing in that direction? Well, she was from Egypt. Okay. Where is Egypt? Egypt is all the way to the, to the California side of the map. See that? We might just say California is e- Egypt is a good spiritual symbol for California these days. We might just say that, but I don't want to get too deep into that, into that theology. It almost looks like California, too. Yeah. All right, we better shut up before we get ourselves in trouble here. So these illustrations that Paul is using about Hagar bearing Ishmael and Mount Sinai and Jerusalem... Not only are these illustrations from different centuries in time, they are illustrations from all over the map. If ever there were an illustration of a mixed metaphor, do you know what a mixed metaphor is? If there were ever a mixed metaphor, this is it. But this is the Apostle Paul pulling from Scripture, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit... And so we receive the mixed metaphor. We just have to understand there's a lot here to unpack. And, uh, and we look at it as it comes to us in the pages of Scripture. Okay? So, I don't even know where I am. Am I reading the Scripture? Verse 24. These things may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands from Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she's in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of of her who has a husband. Now, you brothers, Paul's addressing the Galatians, Now, you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way, Ishmael, persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit, by the mocking we read about. It is the same now. But what does the Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers... We are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Now, how many of you would testify with me tonight that that is a complicated bunch of Scripture? That's a complicated bunch. Let's try to break it down quickly this evening. And we begin by thinking about Ishmael and his mother, Hagar, whose story we've read tonight. First of all, we acknowledge tonight this is a sad story. The story of Hagar is a sad story. Verse 22 of Galatians 4 says, It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. So we make these two notes. Ishmael was born in the ordinary way. The ordinary way. What does that mean? That means... Abraham found a young woman who was of childbearing age 
and had sex with her, and she became pregnant. Ordinary. Okay? But, but we understand that when the scripture speaks of that happening, we understand what's that, what that means is Abram, Abram capitulated on the promise. Okay? God had already promised him a son through Sarah, but he was impatient. Have you ever been impatient with God? He was impatient. So he decided to take things into his own hands and to do it his own way. The, he capitulated on the promise. And Ishmael was born in the ordinary way then also tells us that Abraham commandeered the process. He just figured, I'm going to take it. God has not fulfilled the promise. I'm going to take over here. I'm going to take over here. Have you ever not only been impatient with God's promise, but pr- tried to think, think, take things over yourself? You know what? When, when, when we think that God is not faithful in helping us, and we begin to try to take things over ourselves, we're headed for trouble. And that's what happened here. Abraham, Abram took, took, the, he took the thing over. He says, oh, you know, he didn't say verbally that we know, of, oh, Sarah's never going to, God said that, but Sarah's never going to have a child. He didn't say that. But his choice to, to, to agree with Sarai and bring Hagar into the situation, his choice to do that demonstrated that he was taking over the process. Okay? He was impatient. Now, no, look at these five notes on the outline. One, the story of Hagar and Ishmael exists because Abraham was impatient with the promise of God and took matters into his own hands to produce a son. That's what we just said. Number two, The primary story is recorded in Genesis chapter 16 and 21, which we've just read. And further information about Ishmael's lineage is recorded in the surrounding chapters. Number three, Paul's use of this story as a spiritual metaphor is mixed with a variety of other metaphors relating to Jerusalem, Mount Sinai, the covenants, and slavery. Lots of thoughts here, okay? Mixed together. Four. The Gentile believers, four, the Gentile believers in the Galatian churches would no doubt have had to work diligently, probably with the help of their Jewish spiritual siblings, to sort all of this out. They don't even know the Old Testament. (laughs) They're Gentiles out in the heathen world. They don't know the Old Testament. Now here they get this letter from Paul and we got this thing about Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac and Sarai and Abraham and the Jerusalem that is from above and Mount Sinai and all. They, reading this letter, they had to think, uh, what? Or they do what some people do while I'm preaching. They went to sleep while that portion of the letter was being read. There is no doubt these Galatian young believers, they, they would have needed help But you know what? Those Gentile churches, remember how Paul started those churches? He started those churches by going into the synagogues, by by winning a number of Jewish people to the Lord. And so those churches in Galatia were mixed with Jews and Gentiles. And how many of you know, as believers in the body, we help each other? And no doubt the, the Jewish believers... And those churches had to help the Gentile believers sort all of this out. Certainly. You know, I need help sorting it out. And here I am, you know, 2,000 years later. We need, this is a complicated illustration. And so the Gentile believers must have had help. And number five, though Hagar and Ishmael were mistreated, we must remember That when Abraham and Sarah mistreated them, God himself took up their case and their care. Okay? So let's let's not leave the story tonight without realizing that and affirming it. Could I have an amen? Okay? So that's the sad story. What is the spiritual symbolism then that Paul wants us to know from this story? Well, here it is. Verse number 21 in Galatians 4 says, Tell me... You who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? And then he's going to go back into these historical passages in in Genesis. 
And so let's look at how the, the, the Old Testament story is used as spiritual symbol here first. The Hagar-Ishmael story represents Sinai. Okay, verse 24. These things may be taken figuratively. For the women, Sarai and, and, and uh, Hagar, the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, take out that map again, please, that I had you hold up. Take out that map again. Take it out, take it out, take it out. Look at the bottom of the map and everybody see Mount Sinai again. Say amen. There's Mount Sinai. That's where Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and where God gave him the law. The law of Moses. That is the law of Moses, which is the discussion here in in Galatians. The law of Moses. So, Hagar and Ishmael. Hagar in this story, the story represents Mount Sinai. and, And that covenant. And that covenant bears children who are to be, what? Slaves. Look at me, look at me. To what are they slaves? They're slaves to the law. Because the law is a yoke. It's a chain upon them. They they have not been successful in obeying it. And yet if they don't obey it, it curses them to death. How many of you know if you were under the yoke of something that cursed you to death, but you, 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 you knew you'd broken it, what kind of hopelessness is that? Abs- absolute slavery to the fear of death and to the commandeering of the Old Testament law. Okay? They're, so those who are under the law, they're slaves to all of that. That's, that's what Hagar represents. Because, and the reason Hagar represents it in this story is because she was not the, she was not the route of God's promise. She was the route of taking things into your own hands. And when, when we think about obedience to the law, we have to take things into our own hands to try to obey every fiber and every inch and jot and tittle of the law. Okay? Listen. When we trust Christ as our Savior, we release everything from our own hands to him and his finished work. Are you here? How can I be saved, you say? Well, Jesus did everything you need to be saved. Just trust him. Oh, you say, that's too simple. Just just give it all to Jesus. In fact, Jesus will fill you with his spirit and change your life so much that you'll begin to live a brand new life as a, as a, a faith-filled child of God. You'll begin to live a brand new life. You'll live a life that pleases God just on your own. Without the law, you'll live a life that pleases God by the work of the Holy Spirit that, it, that is working on the inside of you. If you'll follow Jesus and love Jesus and believe what he has given you, you'll live a brand new life. Hmm? So... The Hagar-Ishmael story represents Sinai. Secondly, the Hagar-Ishmael story represents slavery, which we just touched on. And there it is is again. Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia, corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem, because she is in slavery with her children. So twice here we have this mention of, of slavery. Hagar is from Mount Sinai. She also corresponds to what? The present city of Jerusalem. Okay, so, so how's, that, how's Jerusalem connected with this? Oh, we don't know how it's connected, but Paul just connected it. Are you here? So if Paul connected it, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we got to think it through, right? How many of you are guilty sometimes in reading whole books of the Bible without without stopping to sort anything through that might be complicated in the reading. Anybody anybody willing to admit that? I admit that I've done that many times. Just read right through. You think, oh, it'd take me three weeks to sort out that scripture verse. So let's read on past it. So we can get through our daily Bible reading, okay? But 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 this is this is scripture. So Hagar responds, uh, Hagar stands from Mount Sinai. In other words, she she represents the law. 
and corresponds also to the present city of Jerusalem. That's the first century city of Jerusalem there, you know, that Paul had, Paul was, you know, Paul grew up in as a child. Okay, how does the law, the law correspond with Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem, yes, John. Yes, that's right. It was the headquarters of the Jewish people. And yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly right. Jerusalem was the headquarters of the temple and the headquarters of the Jewish nation. Yes. And therefore the headquarters of the law. Okay. The chief priest was at Jerusalem. The high priest was at Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin was at Jerusalem. Jesus was crucified at Jerusalem. Jerusalem, okay? So, Hagar represents slavery, that slavery to the law. Thirdly, the Hagar-Ishmael story represents scorn. Verse 29 says, at that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It It is the same now. Paul writes. Now, let's look at that scripture. Is everybody awake with me tonight? Okay, let's look at this scripture now. The son born in the ordinary way. Who was that? Ishmael, born from Hagar, the Egyptian. At that time, Ishmael persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. Who's that? Isaac, born by the promise. What's the only note of persecution we have? Okay, that mocking that took place. When Isaac was born, Sarah heard Ishmael out there, a kid, maybe 12 years old, mocking. It so disturbed her that she said, get rid of him. And we're not, we, don't, we won't pick that apart now, but we've already talked some about that. But the mocking is this persecution that's referred to. That's the only reference to the Old Testament that could correlate to that. Okay? Notice... They were mocking. And then Paul writes, it is the same now. Now, what what does that mean? That means, look, that's right, listen. That means that even now when Paul's writing this, the Judaizers were trying to tell these new Gentile Christians, it's not enough for you to trust Jesus alone. You need what we've always had. Are you hearing me? You need what we've always had. We are, we Jews are people of the law of Moses. We are people of the covenants. We're people of the old covenant. We know God better than you do because we've had the law. How many of you can testify with me tonight? You don't know God until you know him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, you may think you, you may have had your fill of religion and think you know about God, but you don't know God until the Holy Spirit lives in you and you know God by the life and the work of the Holy Spirit. But these Judaizers were saying, well, you can't really be saved unless you get, go back to the law. Paul says these, these Jewish, these Judaizers, they're persecuting The children born by the power of the Holy Spirit, even now. Who were the ones born by the power of the Holy Spirit here? All these fresh, green, Gentile believers. And the truth is, even all the Jewish believers who had really come to faith in Christ, they were born again, not by the old law that they'd been trying to obey for the last 52 years. They were born again by the power of the Holy Spirit too. Because you, you, we have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to be born again. So, the Hagar-Ishmael story represents and reminds us of that scorn that is taking place. That is, that is still taking place in the Galatian churches here. Fourthly, the Hagar-Ishmael story represents separation. Verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Now, let me stop right there to make this statement. Who would ever want to preach from a text like, get rid of the slave woman's son 
in the year 2021. How many of you, that sounds on its face very inappropriate. Get rid of the slave woman's son. Well, we have to recognize here. First of all, I want you to point your attention to the back side of that outline again. We don't have time to go through it now. We've gone through it. We've gone through it for the last several years every time we've approached a, a reference to slavery in the New Testament. Let me just say this to you right now. God is not for slavery. And, and the New Testament bears that out. There are, there are six very clear biblical principles there about slavery that comes to us from the New Testament. And ultimately, the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, if you can gain your freedom, do so, because we are children of God and we ought not be slaves to men. Okay? We also know that slavery in every culture is a different bird. It's a different sort. We think of slavery in the context of American slavery, which was horrific and horrendous. A, a, a dark, dark page in American history was slavery that, that existed. No excuse spiritually for slavery that plagued our nation in its early days. But you know, slavery has existed down through the centuries of time. The New Testament does not condone slavery. And the New Testament, Paul wrote to, to Philemon when his slave Onesimus had escaped to Rome and had been born again in Rome under Paul's leadership. Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, that little book, and says to Philemon, I'm sending him back to you so that you can have him back. No longer as a slave, but now better than a slave as a dear brother. How, ma how many of you understand that? So... This story, come, Paul is using this illustration from what actually happened, not from what should have happened. Are you hearing me? Okay, so that's the point. Now, where are we? So, but the, story, the whole story separate, represents separation. You know, if you're going to be united with God, you need to be born again of, as a result of the promise of God. Number five. The Hagar Ishmael story represents scarcity. Verse 30 says, For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Okay? So, if, if you're in this illustration, if you're the slave woman's son, you don't get any of the inheritance. The free woman's son gets the inheritance. Okay? How many of you know we want the inheritance? Say Amen. But as we think about the illustration here, we, we again have to realize that even if we were to press this illustration further, we would understand, are you listening? We would understand that everybody, everybody in Ishmael's lineage, there are people all over the face of planet earth today who have descended from Ishmael. Are you here? And every one of them can say yes to Jesus and become a child of the promise and be a son of freedom. Amen. Are you here? Yeah. So, this, as, as we said, this is an Old Testament illustration that might be tough to crack. But we don't want to pu push too much on the wrong things. We want to understand what the illustration is. Is about the, the whole illustration here is this we need to trust in God because of the promise of God, not because of the law or try to do things in our own, take things into our own hands. That's the whole illustration. You can't press any metaphor too far, it falls apart. It's only a metaphor. Okay, are you still awake tonight? Now, let's, let's look then at these five statements. Paul uses the story of Hagar and Ishmael as a metaphor in which he makes the following points. One, the slave Hagar, which is the non-faith option, represents the old covenant, the covenant of the law of Moses, a covenant which led to spiritual slavery. Two, the Jews who are under the yoke of the law and refuse to be saved through faith in Christ are still in spiritual slavery. Huh? Look at me, everybody. So people who trust the law of Moses for their, their salvation, they're still in sla spiritual slavery. But so is everybody else who, re who rejects Jesus. They might not be in slavery to the law, but they're in slavery to sin. Are you here? Everything apart from Jesus is slavery. 
And everything in Jesus is freedom. Could I have a better amen? amen. And joy. Amen. And life. Amen. amen. Jesus is the answer. So, number three. Just as Ishmael mocked Isaac, so the Jews, in this case, specifically the Judaizers, because of their confidence in the law, persecute the Gentile believers. Four. Just as Sarah said, get rid of the slave woman and her son, so God has declared the old covenant to be abandoned and what? Obsolete. Hebrews 8 verse 13 plainly says the, the old covenant has faded away. It is obsolete. We spent a whole week studying questions about the relationship between Christians and the law of Moses. We can learn some things from the law of Moses, but as Christians, we do not live under the law of Moses. We live under the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay, and number five. The, the inheritance, both then and now, <coughs> belongs to those who are free. Those who receive the promise of God, which is now the gospel, by Now we got through half the outline, and it's 8.15. Do you want to finish this next week, or do you want to just drop it? We can't, go, we can't just keep going because we have youth service and kids service over there, and I can tell you what, you want an unhappy children's pastor, let the pastor go too long. We can't go on. It's 8.15. Do, do you want to read the rest of it yourself, or do you want to study the rest of it again next Wednesday night? How many want to continue this next Wednesday night? Anybody? Okay. We will pick up. I've already got next outline, week's outline written, but who cares? We can do whatever we want here, can't we? And so we will pick up on this story next Wednesday night. Stand together, and let's take a...